Okay, thanks everybody for coming. My name is uh, Christian, and I'm going to talk about uh, language support in, and linguistics in Lucene, Solar, and Elasticsearch, and uh, the ecosystem, which is a very, very broad topic. Each of these topics, I think, deserve a, uh, a talk of their own. But in this talk, I'll try to give an overview of some of these things, and also dive a bit deep by showing you some code for specific things that I think is uh, important. A little bit about myself. Um, my background with the search is from a company called Fast that was acquired by Microsoft. I was there 10 years, five years in R&D, and five years in Japan doing all sorts of things. When, when Microsoft bought the company, I left to start uh, Attilica. And we're a small company and focus on search, natural language processing, and big data analytics. We're based in Tokyo in Japan, but our customers are pretty much everywhere. So even though we're a small company, our customers are typically very, very big companies. I'm also a newbie, Lucene, and Solar Committer. I've mostly been working on, uh, on Japanese uh, language support. And I've also recently been doing some work on Korean. So in our talk today, uh, these are the things that we'll cover. We'll talk a bit about basic searching and matching. I'll introduce some of the challenges with natural language and search, talk briefly about some basic measurements for search quality, and then we'll go into how some of these NLP things work in, in Lucene, Elasticsearch, and Apache Solar. And we'll also talk a little bit about the NLP ecosystem. So I'll also try to do some hands-on demos. Um, I'll try to do as many of these as, um, as we have time for. Uh, all of the, the code for this and how to, to run these things will be available on GitHub after this talk. So if you're interested, you can go there and, and, and have a play yourself. OK. So just um, let's have a look at what the search engine actually does at the very, very, very high level. So let's say we have these two documents. Sushi is very tasty in Japan. Visiting the Skiji fish market is very fun. So let's say we want to, to search, search or make this con content indexable. So what we first do, we take this source text and we segment the text into tokens. And we get something like this. And then we normalize these tokens by lower casing them, because we usually want to search in a case insensitive manner. So then we take our tokenized documents with normalized tokens, and then we index them. We build an inverted index. And at the, again, at the very high level, it looks something like this. So we, each, we map each term to each document that contains that term. There's more going on with positions and so on, but for the purpose of this, let's keep things at the high level. So sushi occurs in document one, is occurs in document one and two, very in document one and two, and so on. So let's say we want to search using this inverted index. We're searching for this. This is our query, very tasty sushi. We can tokenize this into very tasty and sushi. And then we can interpret this past query in various ways. We can s look at this as an or query or an and query or perhaps even something else. In this case, we're using an and query. So we're taking these terms and we're looking them up in our inverted index and we're finding these documents are matching. But since our query is an AND query, we need all the terms in our, our query to, um, to exist in the documents that, that, that we get back when we look up in this inverted index. So we see that this term very ex doesn't exist in, in documents one, document one, and then we get this search result, and which that's what we return. So simple enough. Let's try another query. Visit fund market. We do the same thing. We look up market and fund and find that document two matches. But this vis visit and this visiting, we, we don't have the entry visit in our inverted index. So these things don't match. And with this being an AND query, we get no hits. So the key point here is that 
Search engines are not magical answering machines. They match terms in queries against terms in documents, and order matches by rank. And text processing affects search quality in a big way because it affects matching. So if you put low quality things into your search engine, you will get low quality things out. And I believe that the magic often some search engines provide is contributed by high quality text processing. There are some, yeah. So I will now introduce some uh, specific cases with some languages to sort of give you some real world example of s where some of these complexities lie. And these languages are English, German, French, Arabic, and Japanese. So this is an English, English example. So this sentence, if we want to search this sentence, there are some considerations that we should make, perhaps. How do you want to index this, this word? And also, should a search for style match styles? Should ferment match fermentation? With German, how do we want to search these characters? These are things we somehow need to decide. What about a search for Hauptstadt? Do we want that to match Landeshauptstadt? Would be nice, perhaps. But French. We again have these characters that we need to deal with. Do we want to normalize them to allow perhaps people not so familiar with French to get good search results or get any search result? And how do we want to search? Do we want to search for AOC to match Appellation d'origine contrôlée, which is how it's usually abbreviated? And in this case, anyone read Arabic here? Good. So it gets easier as long as you know that you start from here. And <laughs> <laughs> so in this text, how do we want to search this word, which is a, this word has been elongated. Um, it has a tat wheel character in it, which is just a stylistic thing, so that this word gets elongated. So if we search without this tat wheel character, we would match unless we had some sort of normalization in place to, do to, to, to deal with this. And do we want to normalize diacritics, these like beautiful squiggly things on these characters? So if we remove them, we get something like this which is more how contemporary Arabic is, is written. By doing that, we also change, well, we introduce some amb ambiguation by removing them. That's not a problem in practice for, for Arabic because the meaning of, of, um, of these uh, words, even after normalizing diacritics, is still implicitly understood by a native speaker because of context. And also in Arabic, it turns out that it's very hard for, for, for many users of the language to actually type it correctly on a computer. So people often write wrong things, and they're very, very common. They use a glyph that looks like something in Arabic that might be from Farsi, for example, that has a uni different Unicode code, code point, but the glyph is this looks the same. So. These normalizations are hard. Japanese, we have a language here that's, with, that's not white space segmented. So what are the tokens in the sentence and what do we index? So they're implicit. So we can segment this using technology in Lucene. So we get these tokens, but then Japanese language is highly inflected, so in, in verbs are highly inflected, also adjectives, so maybe we want to normalize, um, do some uh, morphological normalization. 
Maybe we want this, is, this word for beer. It can be written using half width characters and full width characters. You have different character widths in, in Japanese for some scripts. And maybe someone also want to have beer match this beer. <laughs> So this is, I think, in, in iOS, this, they use some Unicode code put for, for this emoji character. So even though these languages are very different, there are some common traits. We need to take source text and segment that text into tokens. We need to deal with non-space-separated languages and also space-separated languages, and we need to handle punctuation in, in both. And with German and, and other European languages, we have issues with compound nouns, like this Landeshauptstadt needs to be dealt with or should be dealt with. And to do that, we usually apply some linguistic normalization. We can normalize characters, we can apply morphological normalization, spelling variation, synonyms, stop words, so on. So we have been looking at just a few languages, but we also have lots and lots of other languages in the world that lots of people use. And each language is different, and each language has their own set of complexities that needs to be dealt with. And good search needs per language processing, but how that processing is being done is, in many cases, application-specific. OK, so let's talk very briefly about search quality measurements. Who here is familiar with the notion of precision and recall? Good. So basically, for those who are not, precision is the fraction of the retrieved documents that are relevant. So if you don't have, um, if you have a lot of unrelevant documents in your search result, you have a precision problem. Recall is the fraction of relevant documents that are retrieved. So if your search engine cannot find the documents that are relevant, then you have a recall issue. So should I optimize for precision or recall? We need both, but you usually get one and not the other. And I think that largely depends on your application. So for compliance applications, litigation stuff, where you don't want to miss any potentially relevant hit, you optimize for recall. Other applications where multiple answers might serve the user's information need, and you have lots of different good answers, then perhaps you should optimize for precision. But in practice, I think a lot of tuning work is about improving recall without hurting precision too much. Okay, let's move over to linguistics in, in Lucene. So this is a very, very simplified Lucene architecture seen from a, from a query and a, or from an ana analysis point of view. So we have a document or query that is being processed through a Lucene analysis chain often called an analyzer, or wrapped together as an analyzer. And these um, elements of an analyzer, they are processed in a pipeline fashion. And in Lucene, we do processing on a per-field basis. And this is a key plugging point for linguistics in Lucene. So before we index something, we, we process either the content or the query. So what do these analyzers do? They basically take text as input and turns them into a stream of tokens. And tokens are produced by a tokenizer. But tokens can be processed further by a chain of token filters downstream. So we have a conceptual model that looks something like this. We have a reader that provides the, the text that we want to, uh, to process. And those can have an associated char filter with them. We won't go into much discussion of that, but that can be used to, to normalize uh, 
some of the some of the ca the the characters we uh, we saw earlier in in some of the German and French examples. Then the tokenizer segments texts provided by the reader into tokens, and this other processing further downstream occurs. I'll show you how some of these things work in code in a bit. But before doing that, let's see how how Lucene actually processes this French sentence. Okay, we start with this sentence. Le champagne est protégé par une appellation d'origine contrôlée. If that sounded approximately French, I'm happy. So, we first run the standard tokenizer to, to, um, to analyze this text. And we get these tokens. And then we apply a bunch of filters. So the first filter is this uh, addition filter that remove this, the, these characters indicated in red here. They normalize this by removing them. And then further on, we do a lowercase filter. So this capital L becomes a lowercase l. And then we run a stop filter, so remo remove very common words. And these words get removed. And then we do some light stemming. And in this case, the stemmer also does some character normalization, so we get this. So we start from this, and this is what, what we actually typically would index. So that's the output of the French analyzer. So the processing model for these analyzers is that they provide a token stream. And you can retrieve this by calling a method token stream with a field and a reader. And then this token stream typically bundles together the tokenizers and filters that, that you need to, to do the processing that the analyzer is responsible for doing. An input is advanced by calling increment token. You can, you can add information about tokens uh, using so-called token attributes uh, when, you, when you build the stream. So there are attributes for the term text that we typically index. We have offsets and token types, and for Japanese, we have a ton of stuff. And these token attributes are uh, updated on calls to increment token. So let's see how this actually works in, in, in code. Okay. Let's see here. So I have an analyzer. An analyzer test case here that basically prints the results of analysis. I'm not sure if you can read this all that well, but let me try to make this bigger. So I have a test case here for each of those uh, languages that we discussed earlier, English, German, French, Arabic, and Japanese. And we are providing the, the text in the example, and uh, we are applying a, uh, a the just default in Lucene, the English analyzer, and the German analyzer, French analyzer, Ara Arabic analyzer, and Japanese analyzer here. So there's an analyzer printer that does the work. So let's have a look at what it does. So this print terms method, it takes an analyzer and some text to process, and then it creates a, a token stream using a field here. In this case, that's just a dummy field that we don't, we don't really use, but we need to provide that. And we just wrap this text that we want to process in a reader. Then we reset the stream before we can start consuming tokens. And we add a character term attribute to, this, to the stream. So we get the term text. And then we print it out, and we just call increment token until the, um, until the end of input. And then we print out the term attribute as we, as we go along. So we can run this. We get output. Let's see if we can make this readable. So this is our English text, and these are tokens that are searchable, that, that we typically would index and be searchable. This is the output for German. 
So we're seeing that some character normalization is going on here, and also some stemming, stop wording, and so on. So it's easy to use. So that's the basic analyzer API. But if you want to, to look a bit what one of these analyzers actually does, like this French analyzer here, we can open it up. This is the Lucene code in 4.3. So we scroll to the bottom here. These token strip components that string things together is typically uh, the, the, the last method of, of these, uh, in, the, in, this, in these analyzers. So here we do some, uh, some matching. If we're on, a, on a after version 3.1, we have a standard tokenizer, and we string together the, the filters that we want to use, and that's being, that's being returned. OK. So that's that. Moving on, synonyms. So really commonly used uh, technique to improve uh, recall. So if you don't get matches for things you, you want to have matches for, it's, it's often good to add synonyms for them. I think those are widely used and so important that I'd like to cover them particularly here. There are two types of synonyms in, in Lucene. There's a one-way synonyms and two-way or equivalent synonyms. So with a one-way case here, a search for sparkling um, wine would also match champagne if you use this sort of definition, or a two-way equivalence like in this case, that this AOC and this Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, those are equivalent terms. One matches the other, and the other matches the, the one. Synonyms can be applied both index time or query time, so, but apply them on, on either one of them. Don't apply them on both. Typically, I recommend people to apply them on the query side um, because you can then update synonyms without having to, to re-index. It also allows for easy testing of, of synonyms. It's possible also to um, apply them on, on, the, on the indexing side. It depends on if your queries are very heavy and you're OK re-indexing, maybe you should, should do it on the query side. But I think for most deployments, we want to do these things on there. On the, on the query side and not the indexing side. So we can also have a quick look at how this looks in code. So here we're going to make our own French uh, synonym analyzer. So here's our test code. So these are our synonyms. Uh, so we have a synonym here. This is just a bogus synonym, but it means that terms hello and AA are equivalent. Um, this is funny. Okay. So we have the two synonyms here. Sparkling wine is, uh, should match champagne. And we have uh, appellation d'origine contrôlée. And, uh, and uh, AOC should be, they should, they should, they should be equivalent. And then we have this synonym analyzer here. So this is our analyzer code. So this synonym analyzer takes a reader with some synonyms, and then it initializes these synonyms and turns them into a synonym map that is backed by an FST and fast things that Mike McCandles has been working on. And our components is. We have a standard tokenizer, we have a lowercase filter, we have a synonym filter, and the French light stemmer. So this is a sort of simplified version of, of the analyzer we, that, we, that we looked at earlier, but it has synonym support. So let me just try to run this. Oh, one other thing. We are calling another method in this analyzer printer. So we're calling a method that, method that also prints more details about tokens. So previously, we had this charm term attribute, but now we're also adding offsets, where we input this token uh, starts and stops, and we also have a type attribute. So let me just uh, try to run this. So here we have uh, all our 
our, our tokens. This is our original text, and we have the tokens here. They are type type alpha num alpha num alpha num. But then down here we are seeing that uh, we have synonym tokens. So this appellation gets stem to appel, and it starts at offset 33. And then we have d'origine contrôlé in stem forms. And we also have this AOC thing here, and it also starts at offset 33. And it ends at 64, which is also where this contrôlé ends. So it means that if someone in this case searches for AOC, since we have this offset information in a highlighted uh, results, a search for AOC will actually highlight uh, appellation d'origine contrôlé if that was in the original text. And that's pretty, pretty nice. It's a nice feature of, of Lucene. Okay. So I'll also give you a quick intro of how you can do some in li linguistics in Elasticsearch. So just as a little overview, um, Elastic uses Lucene analyzers, tokenizers, and filters so that all the things in Lucene are, are generally provided. So, and these analyzers are made available through a provider interface. Um, I'm not sure if it's 100% complete and contains all the things that, has, that is there in Lucene, but if, if there's something that's not there, I think the Elastic Search guys will fix that for you very quickly. Some analyzers are available as plugins, Kuromoji, Smart Chinese Analyzer, and, and so on. And analyzer can be set up in your mapping. And I think, I think the previous talk also discussed um, how analyzers can be used with Elasticsearch. One useful feature is that analyzers can also be chosen based on a field in your document, such as a lang field. And that's uh, what I'll show you now. So we have, a, have our mappings. So we have, um, we have documents with a title and a body, and there's a wiki tag, and there's a, there's a, there's a wiki um, field, and there's a lang field. And here I've set up that the analyzer chosen by Elasticsearch matches whatever, this, whatever value this lang field has. So if this lang field is English, like in this document, when we index this document, the English analyzer will be chosen. This is the German analyzer will be chosen, and so on. So Japanese support is available through as a plugin called Kuromoji. And here I've added a, for the, to demonstrate how some of these analyzers can be defined in the mappings, I defined an analyzer Japanese here that just uses the Kuromoji tokenizer and does some lower casing. So let's try to index some of these uh, documents in, in Elastic. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Um, I have a list of commands. Here we go. So in case I have an index here already, which I think I do, I'll delete that. And then now I'll create an index with this, with this mapping that we, that we just had a look at. Right, here we go. We have a new index now. We can try to analyze some French. We can do it like this. So this is the command line to do, to do that. We specify um, our analyzer like this in our text, and we get this sort of results. So these are available right off the bat. We can also do Japanese, like this. This all works beautifully. We can then post some documents. So we're posting some of the documents with the example sentences that we that we talked about earlier. Let's just post those. And they're searchable immediately. So here we can search in Japanese for Shinjuku using the Japanese analyzer. And here we go. We get one match, and we get a match with this token. I don't show highlighting here, but that's the token that matches.
So it's pretty straightforward to use. I'll also talk a little bit about um, how some of these things works in Solar. Solar, of course, also uses Lucene analyzers, tokenizers, and filters. And processing is defined by field type in schema XML. Uh, different processing can be applied on both the indexing and, and uh, querying side, if desired. Same can Elasticsearch. And a really rich set of predefined and ready to use per language field types have been provided for you. So Robert Muir did an excellent job in, uh, in 3.6 to get all these field definitions in. So for example, this is, an, um, uh, this is the field type for French. This is the field type for Arabic. You can just start using these in, in field definitions. You can just uh, use the text underscore AR type, and you can, you can start working with, uh, with Arabic content. These are the field types that are available out of the box today. In 4.4, we will also get Korean in place, which will be good. So I'd like to get um, a little bit in-depth on how Solar processes uh, data at indexing time. So this is a very, very simple Solar architecture from a uh, from a document processing point of view. So here we have a document in XML format, and we post that to an update request handler that receives the document in XML, converts it to a solar input document, and activates an update chain. So this update chain is a chain of so-called update request processors that processes documents at a time the whole document. And this is a useful plugin point if we want to manipulate things at the document level. So we can add fields and, and, and so on. So for example, we process this first guy processes document, passes on to the next guy, and so on. Maybe this third guy can have a look at the text in the title field and the text in the bottle the body field, and then infer what language this document is likely to be in, and then add that to the document as, as meta information. We'll also do field mapping based on what was found. So for example, a document in Arabic could be mapped to uh, a field that has a text underscore AR field type, so that the correct linguistic processing in Lucene is applied. So we can, we can do that using object request processors. But the Lucene processing, it's important to understand the differences between the two, because Lucene processes these things on a per-field basis, not on a per-document basis. So in Lucene, we don't have we analyzers, they don't know about other fields. So then ID is processed. We do not, don't do much processing on ID. We do processing on title and so on body and so on, and then language, perhaps we don't do much processing there, and then all this stuff goes into Lucene. On the query side, we have a search handler that handles the query, and then we have search components, and then we have an analysis chain. We get some results back, perhaps, that are both passed also through search components before they're handed off by a search handler. So these are also useful plugin points for linguistics in, uh, in, uh, in Solar. So I'm going to show you how um, some, of the, some of these things that we just talked through, how we can use a title field and a body field in Solar to infer the language of the content without having that pre-tagged, and then uh, search using that content. So, all this stuff will be available on GitHub, so you can have a play if you'd like. So here, my configuration. I'd like to show you a couple of things. My schema. Conf schema. So 
So I've defined some uh, field types here. Everything that all fields that ends with an and underscore AR does a, has a Arabic a field type and so on for German, French, Japanese, Norwegian, and so on. And in our um, solar config, um, we have defined a uh, an update request handler that ha uses an update chain called multi-language that uses an update request processor called Lang Detect Language Identifier Update Processor Factory. There's one that's called this, and there's an another one for Tika. Uh, but this one has much better quality than what's in Tika. So basically, this guy looks at uh, titles and body in, in the in the input documents, and then it populates a language field based on what sort of language it guesses this content to have. And then it remaps those fields. So something title in English becomes title underscore en and so on. So I have documents here. These documents are Wikipedia documents, 1,000 Wikipedia documents. Um, um, in Arabic, German, English, French, Japanese, and Norwegian. So I've indexed these already, but I can just post them again here. So we can then see how this guy handles these, uh, these, um, these, um, this language detection. Let's see, facet. We can do a facet query on, on, on wiki. We can see that then that, will, let's see here. We have 1,000 documentaries of these types. We have a field language here. We can do, f we can do faceting on that. We see that in the Japanese Wikipedia set, we have 1,000 documents. In all, of these doc in all of this set of documents, we have 1998 documents that are Japanese. Two are not, perhaps, or, or, yeah, or more. But we can then see to find the, the, the documents here that are in the Japanese Wikipedia and do faceting on language. So there are two documents here that are in fact English and not Japanese. And we can see what those are. And language Ian. So there's one document here that has some English text, some Japanese date, looks English, reasonable to, to tag that as English. And then we have a software license, open source software license that's perhaps not so useful from the Free Software Foundation. Have that here. So we have seen that this, this is just an example that this guy is actually does a pretty good job of, uh, of analyzing uh, or inferring language based on uh, content. So there's, a, I think uh, David Weiss recently ported a Python language detector to Java. I think it's on Lucene 40, 4981 or something like that. So that's something that, that might make its way into, into to Solar soon. So just wrap up some challenges with uh, multiple languages. How do we take languages accurately? It's, feasible to do on the on the indexing side, but it's hard to do on the query side because of ambiguity. So how do we deal with it on the query side then? It's usually best to have that supplied. If it's not supplied, then we have these options. But not knowing the query term language is most likely affect your overall ranking negatively. A little bit about the NLP ecosystem. It's a company called Basis Technology. They're a customer of ours. They have really good uh, NLP technology. They also support decompounding for a range of, of European languages. That's something that's missing in Lucene today, but patches are welcome. There's also Open NLP, which um, offers a range of, of NLP support that's perhaps not only related to search, 
to do sentence segmentation, to do part of speech tagging, to do named entity recognition and text chunking. So if you're interested in these sort of applications, I recommend having a look at OpenNLP. So we also have um, a tutorial on, on, on that. I'll just run it quickly. So it basically shows how, to, how you can do uh, sentence segmentation and part of speech tagging, and it just outputs these, these things here. So this text, input text, it can segment this into sentences in a good way. These are the individual tokens in each sentence. For this sentence here, it extracts person names in English. So these are Bill Gates, Paul Allen. They are identified as person levels by a statistical model. These are part of speech tags with probabilities and so on. All that stuff will be on GitHub if you're interested in that. So these are other ecosystem options. If you're interested in doing NLP that are not directly related to search, these are open source frameworks that I recommend having a, having a, having a look at. Just to, to wrap up, getting language right, I think, is a hard pro problem. And doing this right really helps search quality. So there's a wide range of language support available out of the box in Lucene, Elasticsearch, and, and Solar. Considerations need to be made on the indexing side and query side on, on what sort of features to use. Lucene analyzers work on a Perl field level, but Solar's update request processors work on the document level. Solar has functionality to automatically detect language. This is also available for Elasticsearch as a plugin. But you still need to do the, do the language detection sort of outside of Elasticsearch before submitting your document to Elasticsearch. I think that is by design. And I've heard some rumors that somebody might, that there, there are some plans to maybe expand that through the use of a percolator interface. So, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure. Talk to the Elasticsearch guys if you need that. Some practical advice. When working with language, it's really important to sort of have your users' need and, your, and their content needs in mind. You should also understand the language at hand and what their issues are. If you have issues with recall, consider synonyms, stemming, compound segmentation for European languages, things like word delimiter filter, phonetic matching, so on. Issues with precision, consider using ands instead of ors. Consider improving content quality, perhaps. Search few fields. If some content is more important than other content or language, consider boosting that. Some thank yous. Our example code will be available here with some, some readme details. Thanks so much. <laughs>